is about solar energy. Uh, what meaning does it have in the complex of civilization of the human beings and the uh, uh, cosmogony of all the spiritual beings? What can you tell us about sun rituals and uh, what egregores are involved in these rituals? Um, there are various uh, theories about the, the importance of the planet. Um, and if we look a little bit at, uh, um, at the ancient uh, Greek and old Egyptian uh, systems of uh, astrology, um, there they believed that every planet had uh, two spirits, uh, uh, basically a, uh, a pair, uh, a, a titan and a titaness, basically a god or a god and a goddess, who ruled the feminine and the masculine aspects of that energy and of that part of your own personality as the plant is represented in your personal life. In the Greek system, uh, basically, there were uh, two gods or goddesses, uh, anyway, a pair of male and female who ruled every planet. And um, in this way, they felt that these planetary energies, which are also part of our own energy body, our own personality, are reflected in um, how we are, how we behave, and these gods and goddesses were also seen as the guides in how to work with certain aspects of our being, the Mars aspect, the Venus aspect, or the solar aspect. Um, what we see a little bit later is that um, the uh, system of the, of the mated pairs is abandoned, and uh, in general the uh, feminine gods are removed and replaced by male gods because the society becomes patriarchal with Venus being the exception uh, of uh, staying uh, feminine. And also the, yeah, the pairs no longer are just uh, equal pairs of a god and goddess. What happened after that is that uh, people started to have astral journeys, especially in the 18th century and 19th century, there was a lot of exploration done. And they came up with very different numbers of uh, planetary spirits who resided or who guided us in working with these um, uh, planetary bodies. And the number of spirits which, according to these researchers, uh, govern every uh, planet is quite differing. Um, so the Sun is said to have uh, six planetary spirits. Because later these researchers they started to look um, a little bit more in depth at the, uh, at the planets. Instead of just considering the uh, astrological aspects of the self, so that they saw um, the male and the female spirits as being representative of the male and female aspects of our own personalities. Uh, but they started to see the planets as conduits rather for um, greater cosmic powers. Um, and especially the Sun as the, the major planetary body um, is seen as the, the gateway um, and also the guiding, uh, the guiding power for all the other planets and also for the communication between our solar system and other solar systems. Um, I don't know exactly from the top of my head all the aspects of the, of the solar angels. Um, one of them was uh, the life-giving aspect. Um, the other one was the healing aspect, the harmonizing aspect, uh, the consciousness uh, development. Um, so that's four out of six. I would have to look it up. Um, and most other planets have between one and three uh, planetary spirits. Um, by actually uh, leaving the physical body and making contact with the, um, in a way, the, the flow of energy between you and the planet, you can also find out what uh, planetary spirits are actually trying to guide you or are manifesting themselves through you. In uh, working with um, solar rituals,
we tend to focus a lot on um, working with the with the seasons and also the the symbology of light, uh, the return of the light in the winter, the um, light reaching its maximum power in the summer, and the balance between light and darkness um, during the equinox. Um, the solar rituals were uh, also used a lot in uh, triggering uh, temples and holy places where the light of, um, for instance, the equinox or the uh, solstice would uh, strike a certain point in the temple or uh, in some Egyptian temples. Uh, there's actually a series of gods and goddesses and as the light moves also the light falls on different gods and goddesses so that the temple is devoted or uh, in a way a different god or deity is empowered uh, to use the temple at different times of the year. Um, what we find is that in these different times of the year the processes in, on, yeah, at least on the northern and southern hemisphere um, they're very much dictated by, um, by the season. Uh, so a lot of these uh, celebrations are about attuning yourself to the flow which is happening naturally in the season. Um, the spring equinox is the, in a way the balance between light and darkness, but also it's to celebrate the, uh, the awakening of the light, the coming back to, of, uh, of life, everything will start moving again, everything will start growing again. Um, so it's very much the, the in a way, the light of creation, which is uh, celebrated here. Um, during the uh, summer uh, solstice, it is very much uh, the power, the strength of the light, which is celebrated, because the light is at its strongest, the earth is, is starting to be as warm as it can be, and uh, this is an optimal condition because of the uh, strong energies available to manifest yourself, to, to really uh, not just to awaken, but really to manifest, to put things um, into the form, if you will. Um, the fall equinox is again uh, a time of uh, stability, a balance between light and darkness. And the fall equinox is actually the time which is most suitable for, uh, for rituals, for uh, astral travelings, um, because the light is still uh, has been present uh, for the past uh, six months so there's a lot of light energy available so also the energy body of the person is strong but there's also a balance between light and darkness and usually in balance points it is very easy to slip between borders to slip into other worlds and the same could be done also in the uh, spring equinox but then the energy body is not as fit or as strong so the traveling is more difficult. Um, so this is the uh, fall equinox is really also a time to perform initiations uh, both of the self and of objects. Uh, the winter equinox is really the time of stability where uh, the light is at its weakest, the darkness is at its strongest so we need to focus ourselves to stabilize ourselves and also to uh, prune away, to cut away everything which is unnecessary. All our illusions, all our wasteful habits, um, to purify ourselves. And by in a way going into the darkness, um, we can also focus on the light, on the little light which remains with us. Instead of being distracted by all the darkness and all the dark thoughts and other things. So darkness is also uh, a very good time for, uh, for fasting, for concentration, can contemplation, meditation. And uh, the winter is also traditionally the time to tell stories, uh, to share knowledge, to share the inner light, the hidden light, because the outward light is, uh, has disappeared from us. Um, one of the... Um, uh, ways which, uh, uh, in which one can work with it is also to charge objects during the uh, summer solstice. Um, in the uh, Egyptian tradition people 
um, took the statues of the gods and goddesses out of the temple and often put them on the roof of the temple um, during the uh, uh, summer solstice. They left them there for about a week and during this week the, um, the statue of the god or goddess would absorb the solar impulse. Then they would take the statue back inside the temple which was generally windowless and dark but um, it would provide the, uh, the mystical light, the mystical flame for all the rituals and all the magic which was performed in the temple. Um, and these places on the, on the roofs of these Egyptian temples are incredibly powerful. Uh, so if you do visit, be a little bit cautious uh, if you try to connect to the solar impulse there. Um, also connecting to the solar impulse during the summer solstice can be a little bit dangerous. Um, I myself had, did some experiment with that um, because I felt that there were many powers still sleeping, still slumbering in me. Um, powers or memories from previous incarnations, from previous lives. And um, I felt, well, maybe I can nurture them or give them a boost of this solar energy and then I will speed up my spiritual development. And it worked, but that was also the problem that it worked. Um, so I created a, a, a temple, an enclosed space, and invited the solar impulse and put myself in it. So the solar impulse could connect to all these unconscious parts of myself. But because these parts were still unconscious, they were also uncontrolled by me. And as soon as they started to soak up this energy, they became very strong and very active. And so I became controlled very much by all these awakening fragments of my own subconscious. I started to lose control over, um, yeah, over my own thoughts, over my own perception, um, of my own emotions. So I started to drift into all kinds of other realities and becoming totally dissociated from my body. And fortunately there was a good friend of mine who yeah, was powerful enough to, yeah, in a way, take back those powers and stuff them back into their little unconscious containers. Um, because I might have ended up uh, quite insane if uh, it would have continued for yeah, much longer. Um, so the solar impulse is something to be a little bit wary of. Um, the solar impulse can also be used uh, very well for healing um, because it is seen as uh, a life-giving, so it is seen as the originator, the connection with, uh, with the powers of creation. Um, it is also seen as uh, healing and harmonizing. Um, the healing aspect and the harmonizing aspect seem to lie very close together, but the healing aspect is more of an internal aspect and the harmonizing aspect is more of an external aspect. Um, so the harmonizing impulse of the, of the solar is, um, aids a lot in, uh, in communication, in spreading knowledge um, from you to other people, but also receiving the healing powers which are in the nature around you. Um, for instance, in the Maya tradition, they developed a healing system called Reikia, um, in which you also use the solar impulse, the light impulse, to ask all the plants and the animals to bring healing impulses to you, if they can. And so you make in a way, contact with all the elements which are available in nature for a few miles uh, uh, radius and you use the solar impulse to bring all these energies to your body or to the body of the person you're healing. And this is a very effective healing technique, especially if you live in a very varied natural environment. Um, the harmonizing impulse is, um, this is in a way also very similar. So in this Reiki technique you use the harmonizing impulse to transform it into a healing impulse. Um, the healing impulse itself has to do a lot with regulation. Um, our, we have a lot of cycles, we have a lot of rhythms in ourselves and they can be quite deregulated um, because of stress, because of ir just irregular lives, 
because of confusion by pollutants. Um, these can be both energetic pollutants and chemical pollutants. Um, or um, uh, uh, also just uh, radiation. Some people are very sensitive to that if they get too much electromagnetical radiation or magnetron waves, um, microwaves, they yeah, get very disturbed sleep patterns and other natural rhythms. And um, the sun has a very big regulating power and by actually applying light um, uh, yeah, to the skin but also to specific points on the meridians, uh, these meridian cycles can be reset. So this is also a way to work with the, with the solar impulse and it's, it's quite effective, I have to say. When you are performing sun rituals, it is of course nice if you can see the sun, but it is not, um, it is not actually necessary. Um, because in a sun ritual, what you want to do is you want to connect your own inner sun with the outer sun, with its source. And the inner sun um, is usually uh, located either in the heart or in the Manipura chakra, the, the stomach chakra, depending whether the person is more using uh, the solar impulse to, um, to be dominant, to have authority, or uh, they use it to have a clear, um, a clear mind, a clear perception, a clear communication, then it is more in the heart. Uh, so it's important to note that it is not in the head. So the sun is very much associated with consciousness, but consciousness is very different from thought. And the thought processes and analysis and logic happens in the head, but the consciousness happens in the heart. Um, so during the sun ritual you focus on your own consciousness and you try to connect it to, in a way, the collective consciousness of our solar system. So this is not the human collective consciousness, but rather a greater collective consciousness, which includes the consciousness of all the planets, of all the animals and all the plants. In the sun rituals, um, you really want to, to, to work with the, with the consciousness impulse. So this is very much the realization of, uh, of what exists, uh, not just what exists within yourself, which exists in your conscious mind or your subconscious mind, but what exists just in our, uh, in our universe. So we are working with the consciousness. Um, and uh, during a sun ritual it is um, a very good time also to try to harmonize all the aspects of your consciousness with the collective consciousness of other beings and also with your own collective consciousness. Uh, so it's a very good time for self-observation and in a way gathering all the other planetary influences at that time to see how they are balanced. So to look at all your planetary aspects and also to look at all the uh, aspects of the fixed stars because your planetary aspects will be in certain uh, signs of the zodiac and um, during sun rituals it's also possible to work with these zodiac signs because also their energies are a lot easier to perceive. Uh, so this heightened consciousness really helps us in our own energetic sensitivity and our ability to, uh, to realize our own position, um, where we are in this, uh, in this uh, cycle of the zodiac because in all our processes we go through the cycle of the zodiac. So we start with um, uh, with the uh, young fire impulse and move slowly to the old water impulse in, in Pisces. And um, during any of these uh, sun rituals um, you can have a look at all aspects of your life, uh, your work, your relationship, your spiritual development, your artistic development, your um, social skills and just see at what stage they, you are um, at that time and also to see what are the blockages or which are the stages which are strong or which are weak. So a sun ritual is very a time when actually it's very easy to look into the mirror to re really realize um, 
what's really going on because the connections between you and all the other things can be felt much more easily. Um, so in the context of civilization of human beings it is often uh, that in these um, uh, sun rituals uh, they would uh, choose an activity um, because the, the people uh, performing the sun ritual uh, often did this as a community and so the community as a whole would look in the mirror, look at itself to see where they were at and what they were doing and then to realize in what is the rest of nature doing, what is the rest of the world doing, the rest of the cosmos doing and they would try to fit in with that process, to try to harmonize themselves with the flow of the world, with the flow of the cosmos and by doing so um, the cosmos could guide them in a better way. They would enjoy a better contact with the various gods and powers and natural forces and spirit guides. Um, so in a way it is kind of a, a, a realignment between themselves and all the other powers. And um, often during these times they would also start great works. Um, so the to start the foundation of a city or the building of a temple um, or any great expeditions uh, they were often done uh, especially during such moments um, later they were re replaced uh, when Christianity became more dominant by Easter um, but Easter is also uh, in a way in more pagan culture very much also the, the spring ritual the fertility ritual so uh, and it was it used to be celebrated a little bit earlier <laughs> um, really at the beginning of the year which according to the old calendars is in March and uh, not in January uh, also the Egyptian calendars they already used calendars of 365 days uh, starting in March uh, when actually the, uh, the first sign of the zodiac the Aries the Ram um, would align with the sun. Uh, it was in a way partially copied by the Roman conquerors but they ch started to change things around to make the months uneven and eventually it started also in a different month. But the old calendar is really in tune with the uh, energetic uh, rhythms. Uh, nowadays uh, people are starting to use the Maya calendar uh, I'm not an expert on the Maya calendar, but I'm told it also works quite well. Uh, because the Mayas also had a lot of knowledge of, uh, of cosmic rhythms. The Mayas actually use a lot of uh, different cycles of different planets and uh, different stars. So they have uh, literally dozens of calendars, uh, which they can combine into various systems. While the um, Egyptian system is a purely solar system. Um, there are also moon calendars which use 13 moons um, which are also quite useful because in the same way as the sun can set yeah, specific times for starting and, uh, and finishing uh, processes the moon does it also but um, in a way much more frequently um, and it is not so much uh, the great works which are started by moon calendars but it is very much the, uh, the working with the unconscious um, which, the, which really follows the lunar cycle so if you want to work with uh, subconscious powers uh, if you want to do mystical work uh, if you want to do some magical work um, if you want to work with your emotions if you want to work with um, things which have died uh, if you want to work with your own traumas then it's very good to use the lunar cycles for this rather than the solar cycles because this is a process which actually should be done quite regularly. Um, the lunar cycle also has a, a healing aspect and a consciousness aspect just like the, uh, the sun cycle. Um, what you see in, in using the, the, um, the lunar aspect is that it is um, because most lunar rituals are done at night so the, the essential symbolism of it is to look for the light in the darkness um, 
rather than just to bathe yourself in light. Uh, so it often has a much more uh, introspective aspect, while the sun often has a more outward aspect. Um, so lunar uh, rituals are also very good to work with, uh, with dreams and also with um, uh, family connections. Not so much with, with bigger connections in, in society, but with the more intimate connections uh, can also be worked with really well in, uh, in lunar rituals. About the egregores which are involved in, the, in these rituals, um, it is relatively safe to, to do egregorial attunements uh, during, um, during solar festivals. Um, because by inviting the, the solar powers, you in a way are inviting the highest authority in our solar system to be present. And that means that usually powers who do not want to uh, conform to this authority, they usually yeah, try to stay away from such rituals or from solar temples. Um, so that doesn't mean that by definition only light egregores will participate or will be present during a, a solar ceremony. But it means that the dark egregores which are present or which are active um, are in a way there for a very good reason. They are there to teach us, to show us something, they are, part, they are an essential part of the uh, development of consciousness within our solar system. Um, so it is very much uh, a, a safe environment to do egregorial attunements. And if you find that certain egregores are uh, ill-inclined to show up or to work uh, during uh, these uh, solar rituals, that's basically showing that uh, probably in, t in the present time or in the present place or culture or setting that they feel they are not appropriate. Um, so it is also very nice to see uh, what inspiration you can get from the solar spirits to make these egregorial invitations or attunements.